Well, hello and welcome to Sunrise Community Church Online. We are so glad that you decided to join us here today. And whether you are a regular part of Sunrise or whether you're new to us, we would love to know you're here. And one of the ways that you can do that is if you're watching on Facebook Live, uh, just simply put a comment in the comment section. Let us know who you are and where you're watching from today. Or what, maybe even you, could, you can type in there something that God's teaching you uh, through this service or through the message. Uh, you can do that on our YouTube uh, stream as well. We'd love to hear from you. If you have prayer requests or just have a message for the church, you can go on to sunrise.church slash welcome and uh, send us a message that way. Again, we'd love to know you're out there and, uh, and that you're a part of Sunrise today. We have several online offerings throughout the week through our women's ministry department. It has several things going on. Also, we have uh, tomorrow, that's Monday at 10 o'clock, the Backshed Bible Study. I'm a big fan of that one on Facebook Live. On uh, Facebook Live as well, on Wednesday at 2 p.m., we do Pastors Live, which is a great chance to see what's happening on the inside here at Sunrise. And then finally, the Luke Miller podcast comes out every Thursday at 2 p.m., and that's a great way to hear from our new pastor, Luke Miller. Uh, he's up in Canada, but uh, hopefully making his way down here pretty soon. Uh, but some great insights into the Word and, and some of the things that God's teaching Luke in his heart right now. So we'd encourage you to be a part of any of those offerings this week. And, uh, and then we'd encourage you, as we head into the rest of this service today, would you be open to what God is going to do in your heart? I'm praying that he will work in my heart today and, and teach me something new and draw me closer to him. Uh, we're going to continue our worship through the act of giving right now, through the sacrifice of giving. And uh, if you sense that God's leading you to give towards Sunrise and our ministry here, uh, you can do it in one of three ways. Uh, you can either send a, a gift in to our office there, and the information's on the screen, or the easiest way is to go to sunrise.church slash give and set up on a recurring gift uh, that just keeps happening over and over. And uh, that's a great way uh, to be able to do that on a regular basis. And then finally, you can also set those things up through going to uh, texting, I should say, uh, Sunrise CC to 77977. That's a, another good way, easy way uh, to be able to give to Sunrise online. Well, we're going to pray now. Uh, so please join me as we commit this service to the Lord. Uh, Lord, it's in the name of Jesus that we are here for His uh, glory and honor. I, I pray that this service, that this worship uh, together would be just a beautiful offering to you. And uh, Lord, I pray that we would give up ourselves today, um, that you would be glorified. And so we commit this to you. I thank you for this gathering and uh, may you be honored. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. All right, let's worship together.
Sunrise. I am glad that you're able to join us on our online campus. My name is Luke Miller. I'm one of the pastors here at Sunrise, and I'm so happy that you're able to join us from wherever that may be, whether it's right in Fair Oaks, around California, out of state, or out of country. Wherever you are, we're glad that you're able to join us. We've been going through a series looking at the promises of God, trying to take a look at at what the promises of God look like in our own lives, but even more so, how we react to the promises of God. One of the key things that we've seen over this time is that for for every promise, God usually gives us an action that we need to follow through with as well. And, And in every promise, many times there is that challenge for us. We've looked at the promise of eternal life. We've seen how how once we have that, we've got this promise of God's presence. Once we've got the promise of God's presence, we see that the promise of God's peace is right there with us as well. 
Last week, we took a look at a real fun one, which is the promise of answered prayer and, and what it looks like for us to pray, but also what it looks like for us to realize God listens to our prayers and, and what our actions need to be because of that. Knowing that God answers our prayers, what should our actions be if it's, not, if it's answered not in the way that I want it to be answered? Today, we're finishing up the series, and I'm excited for it. It's simply titled, God's Not Done, which, thank goodness in my own life, I know that God is not done with me yet, and I I know for each and every one of us, there's those moments where we're like, oh, I've got stuff to work on, but that's in our own individual lives. I want to talk big picture here. God's not done, meaning Jesus is coming again, and we're looking at the promise of Jesus returning. It's something that we see throughout Scripture, uh, and we see hundreds of prophecies pointing towards uh, Jesus coming again. And so I wanted to take uh, take a look at it this morning. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 14, and we're going to be using John chapter 14 as the base for this promise, and then we're going to jump into Matthew 24 for a bit as well, just so you can you can be prepared. So, so we've got this, this picture of Jesus coming again. It's a hot topic in the world. Whether you are a Christ follower or not, it is something that is talked about. Are we in the end times? Is the apocalypse happening? Uh, is Jesus coming again? And it's worth us taking a look at it in these trying times. Because people have looked over it through history during their trying times. In fact, in the context that we see, that's also what's happening with the Romans bearing down on, on Jerusalem and on Israel. This was trying times for the people of Israel. And, and here we see what's happening. When we talk a lot, we talk a lot about uh, ap- apocalyptic times. And, and it, sometimes it gets mocked. Sometimes it's a very serious topic. But again, we should probably address it. And, and it's one of those things that I think people actually mock Christ followers for. Oh, you think Jesus is coming again. Not only do you think Jesus is real, but you think that he's coming again. And, and I want to point out just even at the beginning, a great passage from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, which points to this, which says, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their e- evil desires. They will say, Where is the coming that he promised? Essentially, mocking the Christ followers for believing that Jesus is coming again. And and so I say that with a bit of encouragement is is that we know that we will be persecuted. We know that that's one of the promises that God has for us is we'll be persecuted for what we believe. And one of those persecutions is about Jesus coming again, something we uh, hold dear to our hearts, yet Others don't. And so let's just talk for a moment about prophecy about end times. I realize this is an entire series in and of itself. Uh, But for what we're dealing with today, if we take a look at it, it's a very detailed subject. Uh, Scholars will point to about 300 different separate prophecies related to the second coming of Jesus. Obviously, we're not going to cover all of those today. And like I said, this is its own series for for its own time. But what I want to point out is for every prophecy concerning Jesus' first coming in Bethlehem uh, when we celebrate Christmas, for every one of those, there are eight that look forward to his second coming. Now, this I say this because obviously there's an importance that Jesus is coming again and, and a focus that Jesus is coming again. Every time it talks about his first coming, the first time he comes, there's about eight more that talk about the second time that Jesus is returning. Next, there are a lot of opinions on this. If you took a survey and, uh, of what this looks like uh, to individuals, you will get multiple different definitions of when Jesus is coming again. And uh, theology of the end times has been debated, it has been argued, it's been talked about over the centuries. Uh, and, and again, no matter what view you hold, you have to think about Matthew 24 and First and Second Thessalonians uh, and how they relate and how this is how coming together. Likewise, the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. 
when we come to terms on, on what this actually looks like in our own lives. The fact of the matter is, is that Jesus is coming again. And while we may not know the exact details and timing of it, we know that he is coming again with certainty. But what I want to suggest is that we should probably avoid the ultimate extremes of this. You know, one extreme of of looking at Jesus returning is to be more concerned about the dates and the times and the signs than his actual return itself, focusing on, on everything that's going around rather than the purpose of why Jesus is coming again. The second is ignoring the promise altogether. That's the other extreme. And going about your daily life as though he's not coming back or it doesn't matter. Because again, the purpose is supposed to be the focus here of why Jesus is coming again. Now, not to quote what I believe is a quote from a fairly famous Californian governor of I'll Be Back. I'm not going to do the voice. But... But we know that Jesus said he's coming back. And when we look at at what even uh, people believe, uh, U.S. News reported that 61% of Americans believe in the second coming of Christ. 61% of Americans, not Christians, 61% of Americans believe that. Uh, Another poll had that 45% believe that Christ will return in their lifetime. And I want to say that that's not something new. That thought is one that was in Thessalonians as they were wondering if they had missed Jesus coming again. Uh, and, and Paul addresses that, that Jesus is still coming again. But 45% believe that Jesus will come in their lifetime because of the context that they're in and what's going on in the world around them. Another poll said that 79 or 80% of Christians believe in Jesus' return. But there, of course, is a much less agreement on on how and when he's coming. In my mind, that is a dangerous number because that's 20% of people who say that they are Christ followers that don't believe that Jesus is coming again. That's a scary thought, and that's why I wanted to focus on the promise today. The Bible is very clear that Jesus is coming again. Jesus communicated it clearly in the verse that we have today, John 14, 3, which says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Literally, this reads, I am coming back. I am coming again. The one who said, I will go, is the one who is saying that I will return for you. That's a promise that we can hold on to. Let's take a look at the context of of what's going on in the world of of Jesus and in the world of John during this time. After his resurrection, Jesus prepared or appeared to to people over a course of 40 days after giving some final instructions to them. We see that he uh, ascends into heaven. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, it says, and a cloud hid him from their sight as the disciples were looking uh, looking up into the air. And as they're looking up into the air, it goes on in in verse 11 that it says, two angels came to them and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back the same way that you've seen him go into heaven. From the first century up until now, Christ followers have always believed that Jesus could return at any time. And that's why we need to hold on to this promise as well, is knowing that there is urgency in our actions because of this promise. This promise is very much one that is a call to action. Knowing that Jesus is coming again, how do we respond? So I'll I'll start with maybe the, the easiest of all the questions. When is he coming? When is Jesus coming back? I mean, over the course of history, we've We've heard of the Mayan calendar, which is pointing to the end of the world happening at this time. You will get false teachers and you will get pastors who have said like, oh, Jesus is coming again on May 13th, 2009 at 7.15 p.m. And, and if, you're, if you're tuning in and you're hoping that I'm going to at the end of this say, Oh, it's actually next Thursday. You're, I'm sorry. You're going to be very disappointed by the, end of, by the end of this sermon. 
But, but people have made predictions over and over and over in time. And, and someone says it'll happen on May 13th, uh, 2009 at 8 p.m. And then that time passed. And then they say they forgot to carry the one in their mathematical calculations. It can't be more clear that nobody knows when the exact moment that Jesus will return is. But that more, again, the focus is on that he will return and why he is returning. The exact time is obviously one that is very difficult for us to, uh, to find out. If you turn in your Bibles to Matthew 24, this chapter contains more about end times from the lips of Jesus than any other section of Scripture that we read, so we should probably focus a bit on it. In verse 1, the disciples are showing off the beauty of the buildings uh, that made up the temple. And in verse 2, Jesus responds to them when he says, Do you see all these things? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown to the ground. Then without any further explanation, Jesus walks about another half mile and sits down on the the Mount of Olives and overlooks the Temple Mount. And it's highly significant that Jesus chose to teach about the end times while being on the Mount of Olives. This is This is one of these these moments where when referring to the second coming of Christ in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4, it says, On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley uh, with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. So here you have Jesus talking about end times in the location which he will return. Now here's a fun fact for you uh, as well. While talking about Jesus' second coming, and where he will be arriving, the, the Mount of Olives is where Jesus will return. Now, this is actually the most expensive piece of property in the world per square foot. And I want to even suggest that I think it's actually per square inch in how it's measured. Because if you've been to Jerusalem and you look up at the Mount of Olives, you'll see that there is this... Uh, huge cemetery. And, and there is where you find uh, the most expensive plots in the world and tiny pieces of land because people want to be on the Mount of Olives when Jesus returns. And, and so it is, again, it's very expensive, the most expensive, uh, because, I don't know, you want a front row seat of Jesus coming again, whatever it may be, uh, I, I find that, that interesting, but here we have Jesus on the Mount of Olives talking about where he's about to return. And, and after the prediction of the temple's uh, destruction, the disciples come to Jesus and ask him some questions. In verse 3, when will all this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Essentially what they're asking, asking Jesus is, hey, can we have a sneak preview, maybe just a rough timeline of when you're coming back? And and Jesus does give them kind of a rough timeline. He says, what will be happening during this time? And this is where our own interpretations uh, really uh, start to take shape here. We see that there's going to be some several things that happen. First, there's going to be deception In verses 4 and 5, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am Christ, and many and will deceive many. And there have been many cults out there that have done this. Many cults that have, have spent time manipulating scripture for their own benefit in a way that they want. From uh, from David Koresh to, to others, you see people manipulating Scripture for their own benefit, usually financial benefit in many ways, but there will be false teachers. Now, one of the favorite things that I used to love to do growing up is uh, once in a while, just for fun, I would, I would go into one of my sister's rooms uh, in the morning, first thing, or my, one of my, or my brother's room, first thing, when they were little, and I'd wake them up, and I'd be like, Sarah, Sarah, it's Christmas. I've got a sister named Sarah. I should probably point that out as well. Sarah, it's Christmas. And then to see the amount of joy on their face as they go running downstairs in this half-asleep days, only to find that it's just the middle of June, it brought a little bit of joy to me. 
Yes, I was the oldest sibling. So all the older siblings understand this because, of course, the older siblings paved the way for everything that the younger siblings got. Can I get an amen from the older siblings? All right, I'm assuming there's a lot. I know I'm getting a bunch of strongly worded letters now from the younger siblings who are watching this, but I can deal with that. So, I mean, you could go in. I mean, I would go in in the morning and I would, I would wake him up and I'd just say whatever I want. It's Christmas. It's nowhere near Christmas. But the joy and the response that came from me saying that, you could tell was genuine until they realized also the sadness later was genuine. It's the same thing that we see with, with false teachers. People will say what needs to be said for what people want to hear, not speaking truth into people's lives. For us, uh, we need to understand that, that there is going to be an increasingly amount of deception and false teachers. Uh, as we near the return of Jesus. The second is that, that there's going to be terrible times. In verse, uh, verses 6 through 13, our world will, increase, uh, will have increased natural disasters, an outpouring of evil like we've ne- never, never seen it before, uh, hurricanes, famines, floods, uh, earthquakes uh, are, are almost always in the news around us. Uh, and And yet, throughout history, we've also seen with every natural disaster, anything big that happens, it points us, it points people to, well, this must be the terrible times that we have. But it's all of these things together. And again, this is this broad stroke that Jesus is painting for his disciples. But here's where I need us to land on today is yes, there will be deception. Yes, there will be terrible times. But there will also be other signs as well. There will be evangelism like there has never been before. The first two signs are negative. Destruction and terrible times are deception and terrible times. Uh, if we take a look at the positive side of things, in verse 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The word nations here uh, does not refer to political entities or anything that we're talking about. It's talking about people of the world. The gospel will be preached to all the people of the world. As we approach Jesus' second coming, this is where the challenge comes in. I mean, I want to say that if you, wanted Jesus, if you want Jesus to come sooner, then you start doing more evangelism. We don't know the time or the date, but we know that the people of the world will know Jesus. And evangelism will expand beyond borders of countries or, or groups of people. This is the call to action that's happening here. Yes, we can focus on destructive times. Yes, we can focus on deception. But are we going to focus more so on evangelism? And allowing people to hear Jesus for the first time? Allowing people of the world to know the name of Jesus Christ, the saving name of Jesus Christ. In tandem with the spread of the good news around the world, we will see an openness to spiritual matters in that day. And this is where it's important for us as a church and as a community to be actively doing this. Spreading the word of Jesus Christ. So, so I realized that I said at the beginning of this topic that I was going to, we said, when is he coming? Well, here's the quick answer. The timing's unknown. Thank you for coming today. It's been a great week. We'll see you next. No, that's, that's not where it ends. It's not just saying, well, I don't know. We know the timing is unknown, but we know Jesus will come when most are unprepared. It also says in verses 37 through 41, as it was in the days of Noah, and so it'll be in the coming of the Son of Man, for in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving, and giving in marriage up until the day Noah entered the ark. And then they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. That is, how the, that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the handmill, one will be taken, and another left. So we know that people will be unprepared. We know that We want to change that. We want people to be prepared by knowing Jesus. And we need to know that we need to be ready. 
Verses 42 through 44, therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day the Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would, have not as, not have, would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect. There's two commands that are happening here. Keep watch and be ready. Be vigilant in your faith. Keep watch and protect your faith. But be ready. And part of that is spreading the news of Jesus Christ. Now, I know you're saying, well, this is a promise, Luke. We know Jesus is coming again. And we know that we need to have uh, be more uh, evangelistic in our nature. We need to share more about the gospel with Jesus. But, but what does this practically look like? And, and we'll start very simply which is saying encouraging one another to take those actions into consideration. To give the motivation to go and evangelize to the neighbor next door. To ask anyone in your neighborhood if they need prayer. I mean, one of the things that I think would be great, especially after we talked about answered prayer last time, was take up the challenge this week of saying, I'm going to commit to asking five of my neighbors or five people I know in my life that I haven't talked to in a while or or close to me that don't know Jesus, I'm going to ask, is there anything that I can pray for for them? And And then tell them that you are going to commit to praying for them. You want to start sharing the gospel and start sharing about how Uh, Jesus' love to the neighborhood and the saving grace of Jesus, you start looking at the hurt that's going on around. So you can start sharing that how, despite whatever hurt you may have had, Jesus Christ has saved you. There's so many challenges that we can do, and one of that is encouraging one another, spurring each other on. The other is living pure lives, lives that are holy. I guess this is the question that we need to ask ourselves today. Would I, want, uh, uh, would I want to be doing this when Jesus returns? You know, when I look at my life, if Jesus was coming today, what would I want my life to look like? And knowing that, how do I live every day like that? How do I, I live every day, knowing that this might be the minute, this may be the hour, this may be the day or the week that Jesus comes again. (laughs) And I think the tough part is, is realizing that there's people around us who know, who don't know Jesus. And if Jesus comes today, they're in trouble. So how do we take action? If you don't know Jesus, the question you need to ask today is, is, is how do I get to know him personally? How do I have that relationship with him? This is something that we have been asking every week and giving you a chance every week of, of this series specifically to, to say, you know what? I want to follow Jesus. I want to make some course corrections in life. And here it is to ask Jesus to save you. If you never turned your life over to Christ and received salvation, received that freedom, received that healing, then I want to appeal to you with all of my heart to be reconciled before it is too late. We know Jesus is coming again, and therefore we act with urgency. Second Peter says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. I can't beat around the bush here. The consequences are too staggering, and the stakes are too high for people to not know Jesus. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, then I want you to do this. I want you to reach out. I want you to be saved. That's the goal of our church is to see God's kingdom grow, that people will come to know him. And I want you to be a part of that if you don't know Jesus and you're watching this today. Don't be left behind. 
Jesus is seeking a relationship with you right now. And if you are a Christ follower, take action and share Jesus with someone. For us online, it's, it's also pretty easy. You click the share button right on our, on our feed and you get to share with all your friends. You get to invite all of your friends to church. But you got to actually take some action as well. Have those conversations. Let me finish with this. Let's go back to the very beginning and the promise that we had. In 14, John 14, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. After telling his disciples that they knew uh, the way to the place, Thomas actually replied, Lord, we don't need to know where you are going. Or sorry, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And then comes the passage, which is, for I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Know that Jesus is coming again. Know that to be saved, you need to know Jesus. Let's act with urgency as we share with all nations, all peoples of the world, the saving power of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, I thank you for today. I just thank you that we can look and know with certainty that you are coming again. It is a promise that we hold dear and a promise that we look forward to. But God, we also know that with this promise, there are some severe actions that we need to take to share about who you are with the world. And I pray that today will be a call to action, that this series is a call to action for everything that we've been talking about, from eternal life to your presence, to peace, to answered prayer, to the fact that you have got a great plan, that you are not done yet, God. The best is still yet to come. And God, we promise that whether we are a Christ follower or we don't even know you yet, God, that today there will be big decisions that need to be made, that will be made. Decisions to, to actively go out and evangelize and share about who you are with others. Decisions for, of people who, who are coming to know you for the first time. God, you are great. God, you are the only one who can save. And we thank you for what you've done in our life and what you're going to do in the life of their community as we go out, just as the disciples did. God, I pray that we will not be looking at the sky just wondering when you're coming back, but we will get to work. We will get into action. And that your kingdom will grow because of the people who are listening to this, for the, because of the people whose lives have been changed by who you are that your kingdom will grow and people will continually come to know you and the saving power that only came from you sending your own son to die on the cross for us. We pray these things all in your amazing and holy name. Amen. Oh. Yeah, this has been such a fun series and I know I could go on and I know I say that every week. Uh, but this has been such a fun series looking at God's promises. I'm looking forward to what's happening next, but... When we look at this week, go with excitement. Go with a, a plan and action. Go and share the saving power of Jesus with your neighborhoods and let's build God's kingdom. Thanks for joining us. I'm, I, I'm looking forward to next week. Have a great week. <laughs>